In the vanguard of the protest are volunteer firemen. They have traditionally been exempt from militia duty, and now they demand to be excused from the draft. The names of several firemen were selected on Saturday, but today they'll see to it that no one else is called. They know how to set fires as well as put them out. In minutes, the draft office is engulfed in flames, and soon the entire block is in ruins. Urgent messages reach police headquarters on Mulberry Street, and Superintendent John Kennedy heads uptown for a first-hand look. Stepping from his carriage, he is surrounded by rioters who beat him viciously and leave him for dead. Kennedy survives, but he'll remain bedridden for the rest of the week. Now the police commissioner, Thomas Acton, takes over. He has only 800 men on duty to fend off a mob that will soon number 50,000. The insurrection has come at a particularly bad time. The city is virtually defenseless, with troops and National Guard units still at the front in Pennsylvania. As they realize the extent of the threat, the authorities summon every armed man they can find. Police from Brooklyn, Marines from the Navy Yard, guards from the harbor forts, just a few hundred men in all. But in spite of the odds, Acton insists on striking back. Throughout the week, the police respond ruthlessly, despite the fact that they, like many of the rioters, are Irish. As the day progresses, the situation deteriorates. This is no longer just a protest against the draft. It is becoming a full-blown assault on all authority. Railroad tracks and telegraph lines are torn up. Police and well-dressed gentlemen are assaulted. The rioters attacked the homes of those people who supported abolition. Didn't, it's not a question of how much money you had, it's a question of whether you were a Republican or a Democrat. Well, the rioters roamed the streets attacking uh, visible signs of uh, Republican Party support, like the gas works and factories owned by prominent Republicans. They went after their homes, they ransacked their homes. Republican newspapers are also targets. Across the park from City Hall, the New York Tribune is invaded. The police counterattack pushing back the mob. By Monday afternoon, the rioters turn their attentions to new targets, African Americans. The, the riot was mostly indiscriminate, and any black person who happened to have the bad luck of being out on the streets would find himself assaulted, often lynched. Bloodthirsty mobs roam the city searching for innocent black victims. Near the waterfront, they seize one man returning from the bakery with a loaf of bread. He's beaten, and then he's hanged. Finally, the crowd sets fire to his body. They seem bent on wiping out a community they view as the source of all their problems. Somehow, blacks became symbols of the entire war effort. The idea was, well, if there, ha if there weren't any blacks in America, there wouldn't have been a war. Blacks are benefiting from the war. One of the most shocking episodes of racial violence is an attack on a black orphanage, the Orphan Asylum for Colored Children. One account describes the rioters clamoring around the house like demons. They break down the doors with axes, while 230 orphans and their teachers barely escape with their lives. The mob strips the orphanage bare, carrying away everything that isn't nailed down. By Monday night, much of the city is in chaos. Tuesday, July 14th, New York City is paralyzed. A second day of rioting brings more street battles as factories and armories come under attack. What's amazing though by Tuesday of the riot week is just how ferocious these conflicts were, the fury of those struggles. Looking for weapons, a mob invades the Union Steamworks at 22nd Street where government munitions are stored. They manage to occupy the building before it is retaken by police floor by floor. In another battle at 34th Street, snipers pick off the police with guns and bricks. Finally, troops arrive under the command of Colonel Henry O'Brien. The tide turns and rioters fall by the score. 
When O'Brien returns to his home a few blocks away, he's spotted by a crowd. They drag him through the streets and beat him to death, pausing only to allow a priest to administer last rites. Like many riots, this one becomes an excuse for looting. Downtown on Christie Street, employees of Lord & Taylor defend their store with guns. But at the Brooks Brothers clothing store, the mob breaks in and they help themselves to stacks of merchandise. The draft riots in New York City were the worst riots in terms of casualties in American history. The second worst riot were the uh, riots in L.A. in 1992, caused by the Rodney King verdict. 